you have to accept that we're dealing with a period that occurred at least 5,000 years ago. And the little we know of it comes from archaic texts that were written in a very occult and esoteric manner. They weren't meant for you and me. The secrets of the ancient Egyptians were not for the commoners. They were meant for a very, very small group of elites who had to be initiated over many, many years to appreciate what this text said. They were for the high-level initiates, which were people who were trained, and they would go through different initiations, tests, that would help them be wise, that would help them confront their fears, that would balance them, balance them in the body, mind, and emotions. Initiates were students who were given rudimentary instruction on the mystery traditions of Mayan and Egyptian cosmic cycles. As they approached higher levels of consciousness, they came to respect different aspects of themselves that were represented in the feminine and the masculine. But they went further and called it sacred feminine and sacred masculine, which meant the purest form that was actually connected to the two hemispheres of the brain. Feminine consciousness corresponds to the right hemisphere of the brain and the left side of the body. In contrast, masculine consciousness corresponds to the left side of the brain and the right side of the body. Patriarchal consciousness focuses on history, linear time, dogma, rationality, waking reality, and science. Matriarchal consciousness focuses on eternity, cycles of time, ritual, magic, altered states, and art. If we examine the art, we can see the characters almost always have one foot slightly forward. In some instances, they take a big step forward. In each scene, the goddess has her left foot slightly leading, showing awareness of the feminine principles of timelessness and magic. The pharaoh, however, takes a large step with his right foot. This shows that he is grounded in the masculine. Similarly, we often see images with two left hands. It has been suggested that this is just a stylistic convention but we should not impose our ideas on Egyptian art. Left hands suggest giving, while right hands suggest taking. In our culture, we've practically erased the feminine in favor of the masculine, reading, writing, and arithmetic. Art, music isn't as important, and our society is completely unbalanced because of it. The ancients knew that you could not achieve high states of consciousness without these being in balance. And so they revered the pure qualities of either. And so when we say sacred feminine and sacred masculine, this was the highest form of respect so that the female would have both feminine and masculine balanced within her, and the male would have both feminine and masculine balanced within him. Balance between the sacred feminine and the sacred masculine runs deep in Egyptian symbolism. We see gods and goddesses carrying a crook, a flail, and a staff in various combinations. The crook represents the balance of the emotions. The flail symbolizes the balance of the mind, and the staff depicts the balance of the body. Once balance of the body, the mind, and the emotions was achieved, consciousness could develop. Notice the staff always has the head of a bird and a forked base. The staff never touches the ground. This indicates that we are spiritual beings having an earth experience. We are incarnated here but our souls can go beyond the earthly plane. Egyptian temples were places where spiritual work was done. 
An arch with a winged disc is always found at the entrance to temples. The winged disc depicts a vulture and a snake. Snake been taken as a symbol of masculine and uh, the vulture is feminine. The feminine and the masculine had to be in balance. The lower self was to surrender to the higher self in order to enter the sacred space. This meant that the ego of the everyday world had to step aside, while the higher self connected with cosmic energy. A vulture can fly, snake can't fly, but both have the same glands. System of life is based on glands. The glands were the most important features of the human being. One of the most misunderstood functions of the human body today is our glandular or endocrine system. Glands secrete hormones that trigger reproduction. Fertility and procreation had high value in Egyptian ideology. The ancients were very much in tune with how the energy systems in the body, or the chakras, as the East Indians would talk about them, were connected to the glands. Ancient teachings speak of seven energy centers in the body called chakras. Parallels occur between the concepts of chakras, or energy centers in the body, and our glands. It appears they are two ways of describing the same thing, through spirituality and through science. Ancient Egyptians had a holistic understanding of the significance of the glands and their central role in reproduction and in consciousness. The great secret of the opposites is that they can coexist simultaneously. And in fact, they need to coexist, that there's a kind of awareness, there's a kind of permission and wisdom that sees that the tension of opposites is actually the tension to me and the surrender of the attention you know, is the kind of learning experience of holding opposites together, holding polarities. And that's 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 the goal. Another mystical and mythical telling of the fifth element is in the idea of the royal marriage, whether this is out of alchemy or any of the myths that talk about bringing together you know, the lost prince and the princess or you know, the king and the queen. But it's about bringing together those energies, the masculine and the feminine, within the head, within the thalamus, what is called um, from the Greek, the bridal chamber. So it's about uniting those energies. And that's when then that fifth element occurs when you have the pineal gland and the pituitary gland working in concert and then lights go on and a whole new world is entered. Integrating the four bodies triggers a unique brain state that makes possible a synthesis or merging or union with higher, normally inaccessible states of our psyche. It is here that our advanced evolution and higher potential lie waiting. This transformative union was the subject of much veneration in the ancient wisdom traditions and is one of the most prevalent subjects of alchemical and magical symbolism. When you get into the real mysteries, there is certain work done in the Ajna Center, which is the center in front of the forehead. Its physical touchdown point is the pituitary gland. And just as the Ajna Center is the switchboard for all of the chakras below it, the pituitary gland is a master controller of many, many bodily systems. In fact, we see the masculine and, f and feminine polarity in the head designated by the early cartographers of the brain who were all flaming mystics of the Middle Ages. So you actually anatomically have 
the masculine and the feminine polarity in the head designated. Now the way that this works out is that there is a certain period of time where work is done within the Ajna center, building the Ajna center. This again is the feminine polarity. Then there is work done within the head center or the crown chakra. But then the real mystical union comes with the interplay between these two centers. And the interplay between these two centers brings a third center into being, a center which is not designated in the books that you will see on the marketplace. It is referred to in the mystery traditions as the heart of hearts or the heart center within the head. It is also referred to as the cave. This is Plato's cave or Merlin's cave. And it's in the very center of the head, but it's not a physical place. It's an energy center. It just happens to be located there. This center does not come about until you have sufficient work in the head center and sufficient work in the Ajna center, where the magnetic auras of these centers begin to overlap one another in the center of the head. And this brings about a third center, which is the mystical eye in the pyramid. And this is the true third eye. Third eye is not the pineal gland. It is not astral clairvoyance, and it is not the Ajna Center. It is a function of the cave. The emergent property is symbolized in an iconic form familiar to us all. It is a powerful symbol whose true significance most people never suspect.